Hello everybody, this is Dr. Nadeem and we are with Neelam Pat Lectures, the Pursue series. As you are aware, all our lectures are available on YouTube. We also have a Telegram group which you can join, which is very helpful for accessing all lecture related information. We also have a Google Drive where the PDF of all the lectures are available. These are the disclaimers. We are with Phase 3 which is Recorded Pathology Lectures and we are with Pursue 21F which is Immune Disorders Session 3 and we are streaming from Ames Bhubaneswar. Today's topic is Autoimmune Disorder Part 1 and to talk on that we have Dr. Amit Kumar Adhya who is an MD from PGI Chandigarh. He is a professor in the Department of Pathology and Lab Medicine Ames Bhubaneswar. Also an ex-professor of Kalinga Institute of Medical Sciences Bhubaneswar with 118 publications in international and national journals, one book chapter, six funded projects, 21 years of teaching and research experience, completed five collaborative research projects funded by DBT and BRNS. He was awarded the best paper award at the IAPM 2005. With this, I would request Dr. Amit Kumar Adhya to start his lecture on autoimmune disorders part one. Over to you, Dr. Adhya. Thank you so much. Hello students. Welcome back to the lecture on immune disorders. In this lecture, I shall talk about the pathogenesis of autoimmune disorders and will also discuss about systemic lupus erythematosus. Our immune system as you know is capable of identifying antigens. It can identify the antigens which are self and antigens which are non-self. Non-self means antigens which invade into our body such as the microorganisms or abnormal tumor cells. Those are identified as non-self and immune system mounts an immune response against them which is very desirable to us. But our own antigens are recognized as self and our immune system does not mount any immune response against our self antigens. This phenomenon of not having an immune response against self antigens is known as self tolerance. So if there is a breakdown in this self tolerance then autoimmune dis disorders will occur. To understand the mechanism or pathogenesis of autoimmune disorder, we first have to understand the mechanism of self tolerance. So in self tolerance what basically happens is that if some T and B lymphocytes become self reactive then such clones of T and B cells are recognized in our body and they are killed or they are rendered inactive so that an immune response against our self antigen does not occur. This mechanism occurs at two sites. Central tolerance occurs in the thymus and peripheral tolerance occurs in the lymph node and blood. Let us understand the mechanism of self tolerance in some greater detail. Central tolerance. The T cells and B cells we know are produced from the bone marrow. After being produced in the bone marrow, the T cells they migrate to thymus. Within the thymus, they encounter antigen presenting cells. Antigen presenting cells are macrophages or histiocytes or monocyte derived cells and they can engulf and process antigens. Antigens are basically proteins or polysaccharides. These process, processed antigens are presented on the surface of antigen presenting cells with the help of MHC molecules. And the T cells can only recognize antigens when they are presented by antigen presenting cells on their surface with the help of MHC molecules. So the T cells which reach the thymus, they encounter these antigen presenting cells. Those T cells which bind to self antigen are selected. They are selected to be deleted or killed. The cells they die by apoptosis. So the self reactive T cells are identified in the thymus by the antigen presenting cells and they are sent to be killed. Such a selection of T cells is known as a negative selection. Negative because they are selected not to survive rather they are selected to be killed. So this is a phenomenon of negative selection of self reactive T cells. Some of the T cells which bind to self antigen they develop into T regulatory cells or known as T regs. The T regulatory cells then escape into the peripheral blood 
where they help in peripheral tolerance they also modulate inflammatory reactions we'll learn more about irregulatory cells subsequently some of the b cells that arise in the bone marrow they go to the lymph nodes within the lymph nodes the self reactive b cells they are identified and they either they are killed or their b cell receptors which are present on their surface they undergo receptor editing so that they can no more recognize self antigens if receptor editing fails then the cells are again killed so basically in the thymus and in the lymph node those lymphocytes which recognize self antigen are identified and they are killed or removed so this prevents the occurrence of self reacting t and b lymphocytes exactly which molecules are involved in this phenomenon or mechanism are not known but one molecule has been identified the aire molecule also known as the autoimmune regulator molecule the mutation in aire gene leads to a disease known as autoimmune polyendocrinopathy in this condition multiple endocrine organs are affected by autoimmune disorders so this is central tolerance however this mechanism is not full proof some of the auto reactive or self reactive t cell still escape the thymus and the bone marrow and the lymph node and reach into the peripheral blood to take care of these self reactive lymphocytes in the peripheral blood there is a mechanism called peripheral tolerance if you look at this diagram you will see that the central toler uh, mechanism of central tolerance which selects the t and b cells negatively and are killed some of the cells which escape from the thymus and the bone marrow they reach the peripheral blood in the peripheral blood there are three mechanism how this peripheral tolerance occurs one is energy second is separation by t regulatory cells and third is death by apoptosis let us have a more detailed look at this mechanisms of peripheral tolerance energy this is a diagram of a t cell the surface of t cells contains t cell receptors and some co stimulatory molecules you would remember from the earlier lectures that's two stimulations or the receptor and co receptor stimulation both are necessary for activation of a t cell but in this situation what happens that only the t cell receptor stimulus occurs whereas the co stimulatory molecules do not bind to the antigen or the antigen presenting cell hence only information from the t cell receptor goes into the nucleus in the absence of co stimulation the nucle the state where the cell becomes functionally unresponsive occurs and this state is known as energy so energy is basically a state of functional unresponsiveness which occurs in self reactive t cells when they encounter an antigen and when there is stimulation only through the t cell receptor or the tcr but there is no stimulation by the co stimulatory molecule another example of energy occurs when the tumor the tumor cells are encountered by t cells as in this example you can see on the left hand side the diagram shows an antigen presenting cell the antigen presenting cell or the apc has molecules on their surface namely the b7.1 and b7.2 these molecules they bind with the co stimulatory molecule present on the t cell the co stimulatory molecule present on t cell is cd28 engagement of b7.1 or 7.2 with cd28 
provides the co-stimulatory signal under normal circumstances. But some of the T cells they express a molecule called CTLA4 or cytotoxic lymphocyte antigen 4. This molecule it competes it competes with CD28 to bind with B7.1. The presence of this molecule competitively inhibit the binding of B7.1 molecule of the APC to CD28 molecule on the T cell. That leads to inhibition of co-stimulatory signal and hence in the absence of co-stimulatory signal the cell becomes energic or becomes permanently inactive. On the right hand side of the diagram you can see that a tumor cell is interacting with a T lymphocyte. The molecule expressed on the T lymphocyte are PD-1 and T cell receptor. The tumor cells they express a ligand for PD-1, PD stand for program death. The PD-L1 which is a ligand for PD-1 is expressed on the tumor cells. So, there is engagement of the PD-1 with PD-L1 and the MHC processed antigen with the T cell receptor. The PD-1 on activation it inhibits the signal produced by T cell receptor. So, the T cell becomes inactive. Now, this is the way how the tumor cells they escape from the immune surveillance. If you remember your neoplasia classes, you would know that the tumor cells are also identified as foreign antigen by the T cells and the T cells they can kill the tumor cells, but the tumor cells they are very very clever. They devise mechanisms to escape from the T cells and one of the mechanism is by producing a PD ligand on their surface. The PD ligand as depicted here will bind to PD-1 on the T cell and produce an inhibitory signal on the T cell receptor signaling pathway. This will lead to inactivation of the T cell or the T cell can no longer identify the tumor cell as foreign and the T cell will not mount an immune response against the tumor antigen. Therapeutically this phenomenon has implications. Now, if we can block the binding of PDL1 with PD1 by giving certain molecules, then we can actually block this phenomenon. There are drugs available now. The inhibitor drugs which bind to PD1 and PDL1 are nivolumab and pembrolizumab. These are frequently used in breast cancer and lung cancer and various cancers of the body. These are known as PD1 or PDL1 inhibitors. The CTLA4 and PD1 are sometimes also referred as immune checkpoints and inhibitors of these molecules are known as immune checkpoint inhibitors. The CTLA4 inhibitor include lipumobab and other drugs. The third mechanism by which peripheral tolerance occurs is by the effect of regulatory T cells. If you remember the regulatory T cells are the ones which have, which have come from the thymus. In the thymus they could recognize self antigen and they developed into regulatory T cells. These regulatory T cells they produce interleukin 10 and TGF beta and they inhibit the effect of the self reactive T cells making them in a, uh, in, ineffective. So, there are three mechanisms by which peripheral tolerance occurs. One is energy, second is by suppression by T regulatory cells and the third mechanism by which occurs is induction of apoptosis within self reactive molecules. This occurs by expression of fast, fast ligand which are also known as the death, death receptor molecules on the self reactive T cells. So, what we have discussed until now is the mechanism of self tolerance that is 
how our immune system identifies our own antigens as self and do not kill them and how if immune system generates T cells which are self reactive how they are dealt with and how they are removed from the circulation so that there will be no autoimmunity in the body. So basically the mechanism involves a central process which is the which occurs in the thymus and a peripheral process which occurs in the peripheral blood and the lymph nodes. There is another term that you need to understand is the sequestrated antigen or hidden or cryptic antigen. So there are some antigens in our body which are not exposed to our own immune system so that our own immune system when they find those antigens they will treat them as foreign. Such antigens are the antigens which are present within the spermatozoa of the testes, some antigens which are present in the brain and some antigens which are present in the lens of the eye. So exposure of these antigens in some instances can give rise to inflammation because these antigens were not recognized by our own immune system as our self antigen because they were hidden from the immune system. For example, if there is an injury, injury to the testes then spermatozoa and the antigens which are hidden can get exposed to our immune system. Such an exposure of antigens will lead to Im an immune response and an inflammation. Inflammation of the testes is known as orchitis. Similarly, the antigens which are present in the lens protein may be due to some injury to the eye or something the lens protein may get damaged and the antigen may be released into the outside where it will encounter the immune system. The immune system will recognize them as foreign and will mount an immune response against them leading to severe inflammation of the eye which is known as uveitis. So we have two or three sites where hidden antigens or sequestrated antigens are present those are testes, brain and eye. There is a whole long list of autoimmune disorders, some of which are enlisted here. Some of them are organ specific, that is they occur only in one organ system such as hemolytic anemias, autoimmune thrombocytopenias, myasthenia gravis, Graves disease, good pasture syndrome. These are limited to only one organ, whereas there are other diseases which are systemic that is multiple organs are involved in the disease. The best example of such a systemic disorder is, is the systemic lupus erythematosus. Others being rheumatoid arthritis, Jogren syndrome, we will learn about each of them individually in subsequent lectures. So in general now we have a basic idea how self tolerance occurs and the breakdown of self tolerance will lead to autoimmune disorders. So pathogenesis, the general pathogenesis of autoimmune disorders include loss of self tolerance and inflammation. Two mechanisms or two factors are responsible for pathogenesis of autoimmune disorders. One is genetic susceptibility, other is environmental stimuli. Genetic susceptibility refers that there are certain genes in our body or certain alleles of genes in our body which give rise to increased risk of having autoimmune disorders. Not all individuals that we see around will have autoimmune disorders. Some of us will have it and some will don't will not have it those who have it usually have certain variants of genetic alleles which make them prone for developing these kind of disorders these genes are usually either 
एच एल एल जीन्स और दे कैन बी नॉन एच एल ए जीन्स एच एल ए स्टैंड फॉर ह्यूमन ल्यूकोसाइट एंटीजन इन एडिशन टू दिस जेनेटिक ससेप्टिबिलिटी एनवायरमेंटल स्टिमुलाई प्लेज ए बिग रोल फॉर एग्जाम्पल इन्फेक्शन इंजुरी यू वी रेडिएशन ऑल ऑफ विच लीड टू टिश्यू इंजुरी और सेलुलर इंजुरी गिव्स राइज टू प्रोडक्शन ऑफ प्रोटीन्स डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ स्ट्रक्चरली डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ प्रोटीन्स विच मे बी रिकोगनाइज बाय और इम्यून सिस्टम एज फॉरन एंटीजेंस एंड सच एन एक्सपोजर ऑफ दिस एंटीजेंस टू इम्यून सिस्टम लीड्स टू ऑटो इम्यूनिटी टू लेट अस सी हाउ दिस हाउ दिस जीन्स एंड दिस एनवायरमेंटल फैक्टर्स प्ले ए रोल इन ऑटो इम्यून डिजॉर्डर्स here is a table which lists the most common hla alleles which are associated with certain common type of autoimmune disorders as you see in this table ankylosing spondylitis is a disease which is associated with b27 allele of the hla mainly the b2705 and b27 o2 are the ones which if present in a individual increases the risk of having ankylosing spondylitis by 100 to 200 times as compared to those individuals who do not have this allele similarly celiac disease occurs in persons who have a special type of hla that is dqa1 systemic lupus erythematosus is associated with drb1 and similarly diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis are also associated with certain hla genes not only hla genes there are many non hla genes are also found which are associated with disease some of these genes they can occur in variety of different type of autoimmune disorders that means they are not specific for a given autoimmune disorder rather they can be seen in a variety of different autoimmune disorders whereas some of these genes may be very specific for a given autoimmune disorder so here is a list of all the genes that we know are associated with autoimmune disorders the non hla genes sometimes multiple choice questions come from this hla genes and non hla genes which are associated with autoimmune disorders try to pause this video here and learn about these genes more spend some time with the with these tables then the environmental factors those were the genetic factors which make a person susceptible for development of autoimmune disorders apart from the envir genetic factors we have environmental factors the most important ones being infections there are two ways how infections can lead to autoimmune disorders one is by induction of co stimulation on the apcs another is molecular mimicry in the first method the microbe enters into the body and it is engulfed by the antigen presenting cells within the cell it induces production of co stimulatory molecule as i have been always saying that the presence of a co stimulation apart from the stimulation by t cell receptor is re always required for activation of the t cells so now the t cells they get both stimulation from the tcr as well as the co stimulatory molecule the co stimulatory molecule on the t cell is cd28 and the co stimulatory molecule on the apc is b7 usually b7.1 or 7.2 so engagement of these two molecules leads to activation of t cells these t cells they are self reactive t cells so they lead to autoimmune conditions another example where infections lead to autoimmunity is molecular mimicry typical example of this is the re rheumatic fever you might have read in your heart chapters the rheumatic fever is a disease which involves the joints the heart and the skin 
here the microbe after entering into the body it is processed by the antigen presenting cell some of the proteins or peptides of the microbes they have similar sequences to the peptides which are present in our own cells so the molecules of the microbe they mimic the appearance of the molecules of our own cells so once our immune system it gets activated against those molecules after removal of the microorganism by the immune cells the immune circulating immune cells will encounter similar antigens in other sites of the body particularly in the heart joint and other areas and they will mount an immune response thinking that these are the same molecules which they had seen on the microbe because the the proteins they resemble or they mimic molecularly with the proteins expressed by the microbial agent so molecular mimicry and induction of co stimulation in the apc are the two mechanism how the autoimmunity set in with the help of infections so those were general pathogenesis of autoimmune disorder let us now move our discussion to a specific disease autoimmune disease which is the systemic lupus erythematosus as the name suggests this is a systemic disease it involves multiple organ systems here is a table which tells you which all organs are involved and what are the manifestation of involvement of each of these organs to so it involves the skin the neurologic system the kidneys the hematological system and multiple endocrine organs of the body are involved so basically here 11 criteria are enlisted the presence of this 11 criteria are necessary for the diagnosis of systemic lupus erythematosus any four criteria if present simultaneously or one after another in a given patient is diagnostic of systemic lupus erythematosus these criteria include malar rash discoid rash photosensitivity oral ulcers arthritis serocytes renal disorders neurological disorders hematological disorders immunological disorders and antibodies antibodies are particularly towards the nuclear antigen hence they are known as anti nuclear antibody this is an example of a malar rash the rash basically occurs in the malar region of the face the shape of the rash is a butterfly shaped rash the rash is scaly because it appears silvery and then it it has got a redness and it is photosensitive so a butterfly type appearing rash which is photosensitive which shows scaliness and is red is usually a malar rash and is diagnostic of systemic lupus erythematosus see similar kind of rash can be seen in other parts of the body a discoid rash is basically a similar rash which occurs in other parts of the body and has a shape of a disc hence the name discoid rash numerous auto antibodies are found in sle many antibodies are specific and many are non specific many of them are found in sle some of them found in systemic sclerosis jogren syndrome autoimmune myositis and rheumatoid arthritis here is a table which enlists all the type of different type of antibodies that you can find in the serum of the patient of sle the double stranded dna ribonucleoprotein smith antigen the ro and la antigen the phospholipid antigen antibody 
these are the various types of antibody that can be found out of this the double standard DNA antibody is very specific for systemic lupus erythromatosus the Smith antigen is very specific for drug induced systemic lupus erythromatosus rest of the antigen antibodies can be found in other diseases as well we will talk about other diseases and the antibodies subsequently please pause the video for a moment and look at this table very carefully multiple choice questions can come from this table pathogenesis of systemic lupus erythematosus as we have already discussed the general pathogenesis of this disorder the autoimmune disorders include two major factors the one is the genetic susceptibility and the other is environmental triggers here also the same scheme applies in genetically susceptible individuals the T cells or the immune cells they become self reactive when these patients they get the environmental exposure such as an infection or UV radiation or anything that leads to death of cells the cells the nuclei of the cells and the cytoplasm of the cells they break down the nuclear proteins and antigens they get exposed to outside the self reactive T cells and B cells they recognize these nuclear proteins and they start producing antibodies against these nuclear antigens hence these antibodies are known as anti nuclear antibodies the antibodies bind to these antigen forming antigen antibody complexes or immune complexes the immune complexes they circulate in the blood and give rise to what is known as type 3 hypersensitivity that is they get deposited on the wall of the blood vessel and which leads to inflammation of the wall of the blood vessel and injury to the end organs so it gives rise to type 3 hypersensitivity these antigen antibody or immune complexes are also recognized by the ant antigen presenting cells macrophages and B cells and these immune complexes they are eaten up and they are presented to the other B cells the B cells they transform into plasma cells and they start producing a lot of antibodies themselves so the mechanism or the phenomenon goes on the tissue destruction production of antibodies production of immune complexes deposition of immune complexes in various organs further damage further production of antibody and the whole vicious cycle goes on the tissue injury basically in this disease is mediated by the immune complex that is the type 3 hypersensitivity or due to the antibodies which are produced against certain cells like against when it they are produced against the RBCs that it leads to hemolytic anemia and that leads to decrease in RBC mass and decrease in hemoglobin antibodies can be produced produced against antigens on platelets that leads to thrombocytopenias antibodies are also produced against clotting factors which lead and prothrombin which leads to a syndrome known as Apla syndrome we'll talk about Apla syndrome later so the morphological changes under the microscope that you can see is basically related to immune complex deposition within the wall of the blood vessel which is the hallmark of type 3 hypersensitivity these patients you will usually develop non erosive synovitis all the serous cavities of the body are also involved they include, include pericarditis pleuritis and pericardial effusions they appear these effusions are usually rich in fibrin hence they are known as fibrinous pericarditis pleural effusions the skin is involved as we have already seen, seen that malar rash and discoid rash appear in the skin 
under the microscope you will find that the basal cells of the skin they are vacuolated and they are degenerated and small blood vessels within the skin also show vasculitis and if you do an immunofluorescence test you will find deposition of immunoglobulin G at the dermoepidermal junction. The picture, the bottom picture shows an immunofluorescence uh, picture taken under an immunofluorescence microscope. This is a skin biopsy and you can see that there is a continuous linear green colored bright accentuation which is due to deposition of immunoglobulin G at the dermoepidermal junction. The lungs and cardiovascular system are also affected. You will find pericarditis, myocarditis and endocarditis. All the three layers of the heart are affected by inflammation. The endocarditis basically affects the valves where vegetation, small granular finger like vegetations appear on the leaflets of the valves and this is known as Liebman sex endocarditis. The Liebman sex endocarditis occurs with systemic lupus erythematosus. This can lead to destruction of the valves or fibrosis of the valve. Both mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation can occur in these patients. Fibrosis within the interstitial of lung leads to interstitial lung diseases and pulmonary hypertension. Kidney is a special organ which is affected in systemic lupus erythematosus. The affection of kidney is known as lupus nephritis. There are six classes of lupus nephritis. That is the morphological appearance may be different in different patients and they are classified into six classes. The minimal mesangial lupus nephritis or class 1, mesangial proliferative lupus nephritis class 2, focal lupus nephritis class 3, diffuse lupus nephritis class 4, membranous lupus nephritis class 5, advanced sclerosis lupus nephritis class 6. Now these terminologies may be relatively new to you so I will go on and explain what these things mean so don't worry let us see how the kidney is affected before knowing that we need to have the basic idea or we need to remember the normal histology of the kidney first as you know the kidney is composed of glomeruli the glomeruli are surrounded by Bowman's membrane the space between the glomeruli and the Bowman's membrane is known as the Bowman's space the glomerulus is nothing but a tuft of capillaries because they are capillaries on the inner side they have endothelial cells in between the capillaries these pink areas are seen these pink areas are the mesangium the mesangial, mesangium is nothing but a stroma which holds the capillaries. So in between the capillary loops you have the mesangium. So class 1 lupus nephritis also known as minimal mesangial lupus nephritis. So there is minimal involvement of the kidney and only the mesangium as you can see in the upper picture which is a hematoxylin and eosin stained slide photograph is taken from the slide and you can see the glomerulus the pink areas in within the glomeruli glomerular tuft or the glomerular capillaries is the mesangium the mesangium is slightly expanded it appears slightly more expanded hence the term mesangial or minimal mesangial lupus nephritis. Immunofluorescence is a very important step for identification of kidney diseases. The immunofluorescence will show you immune complex deposition. As I have already mentioned, systemic lupus erythematosus is a disease where antibodies against the nuclear antigens are formed and immune complexes are formed 
the immune complex is they circulate and get deposited in various parts of the body mostly within the blood vessels and here within the mesangium of the kidney they get deposited class 2 is mesangial proliferative here proliferative refers to a condition where there are more number of cells so within the mesangium you will find that there are more number of cells and matrix hence the term mesangial proliferative lupus nephritis or class 2 lupus nephritis in this case also you will find in the immunofluorescence you will find granular mesangial deposits of immunoglobulins and complements without involvement of the glomerular capillary the immunofluorescence is seen as this bright green color appearance class 3 lupus nephritis is focal lupus nephritis we use the term focal when less than 50 percent of all the glomeruli are involved so in this condition in class 3 less than 50 percent of the glomeruli of the kidney are involved here they show proliferation of endothelial cells and mesangial cells and leukocyte they accumulate within the glomeruli the leukocyte come because the immune complex deposition gives rise to inflammation and inflammation you know will lead to recruitment of inflammatory cells which mostly are neutrophils and macrophages so inflammation leads to recruitment of leukocytes so there is proliferation of endothelial cells mesangial cells and leukocyte accumulation some of them these capillary loops will get blocked and they will undergo necrosis they will die some of them will show you presence of fibrin or hyaline thrombi within the capillary loops because endothelial damage will lead to production of activation of the clotting factors and they will lead to production of fibrin so you will get hyaline fibrin thrombi sometimes crescent formation occurs crescent means a half moon shaped proliferation of cells within the Bowman's space so basically crescent is a proliferation of cells within the Bowman's space and they usually proliferation is not complete around the glomerulus it's usually occupies two-third of the glomerular Bowman space so looks like a half moon so crescent formation is a typical feature of class 3 lupus nephritis this press these presents they will present with hematuria proteinuria acute renal insufficiency renal casts in the urine hematuria will be due to damage and hemorrhage within the glomerular glomeruli which will leak into the Bowman space and come in the urine similarly there will be proteinuria due to leakage of protein this proteinuria is mostly albumin so it, there will be albuminuria class 4 is diffuse lupus nephritis here it is similar to class 3 but here more than 50 percent glomeruli are involved hence it is known as diffuse sometimes within a given glomerulus only part of the glomerulus may be involved when part is involved it is known as segmental when whole of the glomerulus is involved it is known as global here you see similar features that is proliferation of endothelial cells mesangial cells leukocytes crescent formation sometimes there is subendothelial deposition of immune complexes which give rise to very stiff capillary loops which are known as wire loops so wire loops is a thing that you will find in class 4 lupus nephritis if you do an immunofluorescence you will find deposition of immunoglobulin g immunoglobulin m complement factor 3 c1q fibrinogen and immunoglobulin a the deposition of all these things within a single glomerulus is known as a full house so full house pattern on immunofluorescence is seen in class 4 lupus nephritis and the patient will present either as hematuria and hypertension which is known as a nephritic syndrome or patient may present with 
severe proteinuria albuminuria without hypertension that is known as nephrotic syndrome so this is an immunofluorescence picture showing green fluorescent deposition of immunoglobulin a immunoglobulin g m c3 and c1q within the glomerulus this particular phenomenon is known as a full house immunofluorescence pattern which is a feature of lupus nephritis do not forget this class 5 is known as membranous lupus nephritis here mesangium is not involved rather the capillary basement membrane is thickened there is diffuse thickening of capillary basement membrane due to deposition of subepithelial immune complexes there is increased production of basement membrane like material and the capillary loops appear very thick and this is known as membranous lupus nephritis these patients usually present as nephrotic syndrome nephrotic syndrome as i have already said is a syndrome where the patient presents with heavy proteinuria that is more than 3 gram of protein is excreted in the urine in a day and this protein is mostly albumin so there is albuminuria there is loss of albumin from the body leads to swelling of the body due to edema so there is edema albuminuria proteinuria but there is no hypertension unlike nephritic syndrome class 6 is the advanced lesions where the like all inflammation they will either heal or they will produce scarring due to fibrosis so this is the end stage of systemic lupus erythematosus where the inflammation is gone and there is only scarring or sclerosis of the glomeruli so there is sclerosis of more than 90 percent of the glomeruli and it represents an end stage renal disease now the kidney is totally gone and only way to so for survival is hemodialysis or kidney transplantation so we have discussed about the six classes of lupus nephritis class 1 is minimal mesangial lupus nephritis class 2 mesangial proliferative class 3 is focal lupus nephritis class 4 is diffuse lupus nephritis which can be segmental or global class 5 is membranous lupus and class 6 is advanced sclerosing lupus nephritis another phenomenon the LE cell phenomenon or the lupus erythematous cell phenomenon occurs in SLE that needs a special mention previously when we did not have sophisticated diagnostic facilities and uh, antibodies detection was not easy then we used this test the LE cell test for identification and diagnosis of SLE what happens is that in these patients the peripheral blood is taken and it's shaken vigorously within a glass test tube that will lead to disruption of the neutrophils the neutrophilic cytoplasm will disintegrate and the nucleus gets exposed to the serum in the serum of these patients we know that anti-nuclear antibodies are there so when the nucleus of the neutrophil they get exposed to the serum the antibodies will bind to these nuclear antigens and they will lead to disintegration of the chromatin the chromatin will appear smudgy and start looking like a hematoxyphilic body within the neutrophil these hematoxylinphilic body these are basically antigen antibody complexes so they will be eaten up by other neutrophils when eaten up by other neutrophils they will appear like pink or hematoxyphilic bodies within the cytoplasm of a neutrophil such a cell is known as LE cell and it was classical or diagnostic of lupus erythematosus So apart from lupus erythematosus there are certain 
other erythematous diseases which can affect only the skin one of which is a chronic discoid lupus erythematosus it is different from sle here only the skin is involved 35 percent of these patients they show anti-nuclear antibody and a skin biopsy shows a similar pattern as that of sle which is immunoglobulin g and c3 deposition at the dermo epidermal junction then there is another variant of this disease known as the subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus here there is widespread superficial non-scarring lesions all around the skin and they will show you antibodies against the ssa antigen and these patients they typically have hla dr3 genotype then there is another type of variant of lupus nephr lupus erythematosus known as the drug induced lupus erythematosus they usually occur with the use of hydrolazine prokinamide d benzylamine isoniazide and anti tnf treatment these patients also will have anti-nuclear antibody anti-histone antibodies are very classical of this drug induced lupus erythematosus these patients will have joint involvement serositis and fever but cns and kidney are not involved so today we have discussed about the general pathogenesis of autoimmune disorders the systemic lupus erythematosus its manifestations and its pathogenesis and some variation of systemic lupus erythematosus so that will be all for today see you later